we wrote this book, uh, all three of us. It was a, a perfect uh, storm of three individuals. Um, I did most of the writing. Stuart Mowbray, my co-author, did the layout and all the photography. And Brian Hendelson's the man who made it possible. In 2014, Brian acquired the, the last remaining Washington-owned sword that's in private hands. And as it came to Mount Vernon and we started looking at that sword in conjunction with the other Washington swords, it, it almost screamed at us that nobody had ever decided to tackle this amazing group of swords. There are no other groups of swords from the period that were uh, assembled over an adult's lifetime over the course of decades that just by chance belonged to a very important individual. So it was a golden opportunity to take these swords, tell their stories, relate them to each other, and at the same time clear up some of the, uh, the misinformation that's been bandied about concerning a lot of these swords. And not to mention nowadays uh, with the quality photography that you can do, it was a chance to show these things in full beautiful color. Conservatively, he had at least 11, but I'm betting there were more. If, if somebody really tried to push me and say, how many do you think he had? I would bet the number is probably closer to maybe 16, maybe 18. We just don't know. Most of his swords could be seen as dual purpose. Um, the swords that he had that were true military instruments, from what we can tell, were all gifts. They weren't swords he went out and purchased. Uh, the swords that we know he went out and acquired tend to be katos, which are, you know, sort of lightly hilted, curved bladed weapons that could be worn while out riding, or they could be worn on military service. And the, the more formal type of sword, a small sword with a longer straight blade and a, a particular type of hilt architecture was uh, the, the sort of thing he would have worn on more dressy occasions. But none of them were specifically military. None of the swords he acquired for himself. There's one in private hands, the last one. There are four that are owned by the Mount Vernon Ladies Association. There are two at Morristown National Historic Park. And there's one at the, uh, the State Library of New York in Albany. The only one we can place for sure is the steel-hilted small sword that's now in the collection of the New York State Library. There was a description uh, penned by a visitor who uh, paid a call to Washington at the presidential mansion in Philadelphia in 1795, and he describes Washington wearing a black velvet suit and having a, a beautiful steel-hilted small sword at his side with a, a white vellum scabbard. So we know that one's there for sure. It's fairly safe to assume that the, um, the green-handled cutto was seen on Washington's side in the 1790s when he was a uh, president and he was, he was reviewing troops that were you know, headed off. So we knew he wore that then. We know for sure that the silver-hilted small sword of 1767 was the sword that he probably wore when he resigned his commission and probably the one he wore when he was inaugurated for the first time in 1789. Probably the, the best group of paintings are the series of portraits of Washington done during the Revolutionary War period by Charles Wilson Peale, and they show a variety of Washington swords which still exist. There are a number of portraits that show small swords that we're not quite sure. Uh, there's a, a, a particular portrait that has a sword that looks very much like the 1767 small sword, but the color is wrong. The color of the grip looks like it's copper. It doesn't quite make sense. So that could be taken as evidence of, for the existence of another sword that's currently whereabouts unknown. When we get into the 19th century, by that point, Washington is long gone. He's out of the public eye. His swords have been dispersed, and they're in the hands of descendants. And I guess you had to kind of come up with a basic sword to put in your painting. But a few of them got it right. Um, when Vanderlyn executed a, a beautiful version of the Lansdowne portrait of Washington after Stewart's original, he very clearly depicted the steel-hilted small sword, which was then the, uh, in the possession of George Corbin Washington. This is in the 1830s. He obviously had access to this sword and put it in that particular painting. When Leutze painted his famous Washington crossing the Delaware River, he very clearly shows an erroneous representation of what's clearly the Bailey silver and ivory hilted cutto. But that sword, by 1850, was in the, uh, the hands of the United States people because it had been donated through Congress uh, in 1843. So he certainly would have had access to it. He would have been able to see it. Or he may have seen a representation of that sword in the 1779 Peel Canvas showing Washington at the Battle of Princeton. 
Uh, the one sword that Washington had that I would say would have been unfashionable is a 17th century sword that we believe is ancestral. So he would have inherited it. And uh, like anything you might get from your ancestor, you cherish it, you love it, but you don't necessarily want to use it all the time. Washington was very conscious of his image. He followed fashion. And one of the best ways you can look at how he kept fashionable is if you follow his succession of small swords. Uh, true, one of them was a gift, but they distinctly follow what was really in fashion in London between the 1750 period and what was really fashionable at the height of the revolution. Uh, his steel-hilted small sword, we recently found out dates from at least 1779. We have concrete proof of that in Washington's own words that it was in his hands, but it's, it's almost an ahead of its time sword. Most sword scholars would look at it and place it in the mid 1780s at the earliest. We know swords like this did exist uh, as early as the late 1770s, but it's the sort of thing you'd expect to see just in London. So how Washington gets his hands on one at the height of the revolution when he's certainly doing no business with anybody in London is a real mystery to us. He had a, a very interesting provision. Um, he decided that he wanted five of his nephews, not all of his nephews, five specific nephews, each to pick one sword, and then the order he listed them in his will is the order they were to choose. And he put in an interesting passage in there. He said, in talking about the swords, he quantified them as, of which I may die possessed. So he's telling you, sometimes I get rid of swords, sometimes people give me swords, sometimes I buy a new sword, I don't know how long I'm going to live, swords come and go. So that's a, a very sort of a tantalizing insight into the way he saw them.